holistic understanding of, of spirituality or ministry would, would be a hoped for outcome. But I think the vast majority are probably agreeing with what Linda says, right? We want our Sunday schools full, right? We want the pews full like they used to be. We want, you know, all of, all of the things that, that for, by and large, were the good old days of the 60s, right? Those, those perfect days of when everything was perfect, right? A um, few problems with that. Like we heard the first thing, society has changed. Uh, and, and to be totally blunt, we can never go back to the way things were, right? For lots of different reasons, whether that's you know, demographics, whether that's uh, influence the church has, whether that's you know, uh, cultural practices or, or anything like that, right? There is no recovering to you know, a church of 200 kids when the average family has 1.2 kids you need 800 adults, sorry, 800 couples to have that number of people in Sunday school. It is a dream that, that in some respects is impossible because the world has changed, right? Uh, another reason is that people don't approach faith in the same ways, right? They're more interested in experience than they are about knowledge. People don't want to learn about faith. They want to do faith, right? For, for many of our younger generations, uh, and the last thing, and this is probably the more important thing, going back to the way things used to be is not the way that God operates, right? That has never been the story of faith. Throughout the Bible, God always leads people to new and surprising things and, and does that in a way of renewing faith. Um, rarely does God ever call people to move back to reclaim the things exactly the way that they were. Uh, no matter how good they might have seemed, right? Does anyone know the setting here of Isaiah chapter 43? Yeah, people, people are about to leave captivity in Babylon, right? Where they have been for generations. Um, the Israelites are, are in captivity, and what do you think is happening? To, to, Babel, or to the Israelites when they are carried into another country away from their temple, away from everything else, and have been there for generations. It's not the way it used to be. It's absolutely not the way it used to be, you're right. But, but what else is happening? The, the parents are saying, but my kids aren't following the same things that we used to do, right? The younger generations aren't following the same traditions. Uh, the way things that they were, the way that they were doing things, were being forgotten. You know, in other words, they saw this sort of slow death of their faith that was so important to them for so long. Um, and some people were walking away from God altogether and starting into other religions around them in captivity. Um, the society that they lived in didn't automatically support their religion anymore, right? Uh, the Babylonians were not throwing, uh, you know, parties for Yom Kippur and for all of these other traditions, right? Does that sound familiar to what we were just talking about as the problem with, with church nowadays in the 21st century? Does it sound almost identical? So this is the story of the early church, uh, very, very early church. Um, who were the people that made up the early church? Largely Jewish. Largely Jewish? <coughs> Slaves. Slaves, okay. <coughs> yeah. So people that either didn't have a place or people that came very solidly from, from a religious tradition, right? Most of the early church, these people would, would have been Jewish. Um, do you think that it was common practice for Jewish people to sell everything they had give it away, live in community, and eat together all the time, like Acts had described. Not in a million years. I mean, there was you know, things put in place to take care of the poor, but for sure not to that extreme, right? And keep in mind that the people who were the early Christians were also still Jewish. Right? They were seen as a, as a sect within Judaism, so they would have still gone to the temple or to the synagogue. They would have still practiced their traditional um, 
you know, their traditions, their way of life, held the same kind of beliefs, but then they started doing this, right? So what's going on here? Why would they do that? Why would they sell their possessions? Why would they live in this community? Why would they do the kinds of things that they did? Because they were ostracized by the surrounding society. Okay. Okay, yeah. Ostracized, they, they, they yeah. weren't, they for sure weren't the majority, right, in, in their, in their uh, society, right? Anyone know if Christianity is a majority in our society anymore? Right. Yeah. Nope, it is not, right? So, similar. Why else would they do this? The text says they focus on scripture and prayer. Mm-hmm. I was with prayer. Right, and, and scripture in this sense would have been the Old Testament, right? This would have been the Jewish canon that they would have followed, for sure. But yeah, they, that was one of the things they focused on as a way of focusing on what matters, right? Figuring out what's important, making sure that, you know, they understood what Jesus meant as far as how God was working within the world. Right? I, I serve a church that has a very strong youth group, and uh, lots of people say to me, we never see the youth in church, right? Because they're there eh, once a month. <coughs> never see them in church. Well, that's because they're at the CLWR warehouse helping out. They're at the evening service that night. They're at whatever else. The youth calendar is by far the busiest calendar in our church of doing things, but they're not there on Sunday morning. Right? They are growing in faith. They are living out their faith, but they're not doing it in the same kinds of ways that we expect them to, right? So that's a, a challenge for people in the congregation where I serve. So, uh, last question. Where's God leading us? And can we trust God enough uh, to let God lead, even if we're not sure where that's going to go? Even if we're not sure what that's going to look like? Um, and, and maybe that's part of what it means to be the church in the 21st century, is to reclaim our trust that God leads, that, that God knows where we need to be headed. Uh, and in some cases, to go along for the ride with that. We looked at, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. I've got uh, a few people lined up that are going to uh, share some stories. First is Tyler. Uh, Tyler's with CLWR and our Synod, uh, focusing on youth and young adult ministry, and has been doing that for quite some time. I think, for, since he arrived in Winnipeg. Yeah. Uh, and so he's going to talk a little bit about some of the issues and, and uh, uh, perspectives that he's seen uh, within youth and young adult ministry and, and how that is changing for the 21st century. Uh, I'm also going to ask Lisa Janke to come up, uh, intern, part-time at Synod, part-time at St. Luke's Zion. Uh, and she's going to talk a little bit about um, how we understand and talk about God and maybe alternative ways of, of, of seeing God and uh, relating to God that, uh, that are helpful in a changing society as well. Uh, and I'm going to ask Eric uh, Parker, who is the Dean of Interlake and uh, pastor here at Good Shepherd. He's going to talk about um, changing ways that we communicate, so uh, how people access theological um, uh, writings and and how people are informed by their faith and especially the use of social media and how that can uh, affect faith formation and how people interact in their faith so my work with the synod is youth and young adult uh, ministry person um, my experience had me in a university context in Kelowna before coming here that wasn't full-time work with the university. It was um, along with some parish responsibilities and so on. But um, one of the things that I came to realize in doing work with young adults, particularly uh, in a um, university or college context, was um, how their experience obviously influenced their level of desire to commit to faith community. And um, the way I framed it is that people who are maybe 35, 40 years old and younger, um, and, and it, in this case, the young adults are people who are away from home uh, for the first time and so on too, um, would, their parents would have stopped going to church in the 60s and 70s into the 80s. Um, and so when they were born, they weren't necessarily baptized. Uh, they didn't necessarily go to Sunday school. 
So they lack those kinds of memories, whether it's photographs of baptism or whether it's positive experiences in a Sunday school teacher or Sunday school classes. And then in the 80s and 90s, uh, would have um, heard some pretty terrible stuff in the media about church, whether it's abusive priests, whether it's residential schools and so on. And then more recently, say in the last 10 or 15 years, there's been um, some books written uh, that would sort of fall into what might be called the new atheist category. And I, um, I point to things like The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, or um, Christopher Hitchens' God is Not Great. Sam Harris wrote one, and they're all sort of bestsellers and got lots of traction. And, um, and with the absence of a church or faith community that was a positive thing in their lives, um, young people might hear those as decent theological pieces, even though somebody like Dawkins would be a biologist, Hitchens, of course, is a journalist, Sam Harris, I think, is a psychologist as well. And so, in all of this, um, it starts to call the church into a new place, because I think the church needs to engage those questions that are raised about what we believe, whether it's questions that are raised in the New Atheist Movement, you know, are churchgoers hypocrites, you know, are they superstitious people? I think we need to acknowledge some pieces, and then maybe, maybe also need to ground ourselves differently than we have in the past, um, in terms of what we do believe and how we talk about it. So I, I think that becomes part of the piece that informs us. I think it makes it an exciting time in history to be the church, too. Um, we've, at least in the Lutheran tradition, largely come out of Scandinavian and German background. And, um, and we we're talking about sort of the heyday of the church being sort of in the 50s and 60s. Well, that was post-World War II. And so there were lots of uh, people coming from Europe to Canada. And so people were also wanting to carry their culture with them in some way or another. And, and the church was that for a lot of people. Um, and so we, as church, wanting to reach out um, to young people and wanting to acknowledge realities of today, uh, need to also bear in mind some of the, the, difference, the difference in context in which we live. And um, so, yeah, those are some thoughts that I had coming into this conversation today. I'll pass on to Lisa. Thanks. So I was asked to talk a little bit about expansive language and images, and so I think a good thing to keep in mind is that the words and images that we use, they have enormous power. Words define people and things. Words can hurt and oppress. Words can heal and liberate. And so today, specifically talking about the image of God, I think that, I know it's true for me, it's probably true for most of us in this room that our image of God has largely been handed to us, uh, mostly by very well-intentioned people in our lives. Um, and, and for me, it was largely through the church. But the church isn't the only voice that speaks to who God is. And in the secular world, there's images and words about God that abound. Tyler just spoke to this a little bit. Um, and I think even though we have these, this vast array of places where we're getting images and words about God, we still largely have a God in a box. And so what do I mean when I say God in a box? What is this box? It's largely that God is still primarily pictured in human form, um, often uh, with specific characteristics, powerful, omnipotent, you know, those very strong characteristics. And also the box would be white and male to a large extent. This includes when I travel to Cameroon, God was still white, you know, Jesus was still white. So it's predominantly, I think we could probably agree that this is the image of God. So the image is very good, actually, in many ways. It's very helpful for many people. It has been helpful in many ways over the years. And I'll, you might be surprised to hear me say that if you know me. But the, <laughs> but the reason I say that is that that image has brought comfort to many people for a long time. And it's understandable why we came to that image, because it's an image that represents the most powerful person that we could possibly imagine for, for many ways. And so, so we can kind of see why, why that happened. In our desire to comprehend God, we created an image that was based on our limited ability to understand. 
Now, the other side of that, of course, is that God doesn't want to be in a box. I mean, when Moses turned to the burning bush and said, you know, what is your name? God said, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. God refuses to be put in a box. And the truth is, from our side of things, uh, we don't actually benefit from having God in a box either. So as comforting as it can be at one level, we can really benefit from, from expansive images. So I want to actually read to you a quote from uh, theologian Terence Fretheim. It is not enough to say that one believes in God. What is important finally is the kind of God in whom one believes, or to use different language, metaphors matter. The images used to speak of God not only decisively determine the way one thinks about God, they have a powerful impact on the shape of the life of the believer. They may, in fact, tend to shape a life toward unbelief. So that's, I think, really important when we think about where we're at right now. And so to just kind of give you a, a snippet of a personal example, I'll read to you um, just a short piece of, of my faith journey. As a young adult, I had the rug pulled out from under me when I realized that the male God I prayed to was not an image of my choosing. I quickly went from being aware of this fact to being furious about it. This ended up at the center of all the injustice and violence towards women that I was becoming aware of. I believe this was because my practice was to turn to God with my pain and suffering. But now, even in prayer, I felt violated with an image that I did not consent to. My belief in God remained strong. I was just extremely disappointed in him. As much as I sought out new images, the image of the Father was too pervasive. I saw my new awareness of women's issues and my work in violence prevention as a cross I had to bear, and I resented that a male determined this calling for me. My suffering was real and deep, and yet many could not understand it or would not recognize it. Then one day, I saw her so clearly, powerful, beautiful, confident, open, wise. She was crying, and then I noticed that I was too. Her tears were for me, for the burden of all the truth I had to bear. Thank you, she said, for my willingness to help mend a broken creation. Now I could understand. Now I could accept my vocation. I could do this for her. I returned to being more open in my relationship with God and began a process of healing my relationship with the church that continues to this day. The image we hold of God matters. And it's not just a feminist issue, and it's not just an inclusive language issue. Another theologian, Elizabeth Johnson, writes, the symbol of God is significant for individuals as a focus of absolute trust, one to whom you can give yourself without fear of betrayal, the holy mystery of God undergirds and gives direction to all of a believing person's enterprises, principles, choices, values, and relationships. And also the language that the faith community uses represents its values and molds its identity. So we know that these symbols and images have powerful implications for our church and for us as individuals. So finally, what can we do? And what I'll share with you here finally is just kind of the four layers of responses that we can take. The first kind of 101 basic level is that we commit to using non-sexist language. And this is actually something I think most, most of our churches have been working at for a long time. That's where we changed the song, Good Christian Men Rejoice to Good Christian Friends Rejoice. Right? It's, a, it's small in some ways, but it's very important. The second layer is inclusive language. So that's where we seek to set male and female language for God side by side. So this happens, say, if you read the Lord's Prayer as our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven. Um, I was in a church where I baptisms. You baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Mother of us all. So these are just some of those examples. The problem is that Naming male and female side by side doesn't just automatically equalize the power between male imagery and female imagery. 
We have seen this when God the Father still has those powerful characteristics and God the Mother has the compassionate characteristics. So that there's still some, some problems there. But these are still have been very powerful practices. The third layer would be emancipatory language. So that's saying, you know what, we've used father and male images for too long, we have to stop. It means that we need to hear things more than once, more than even a hundred times for them to stick, so we totally switch the images that we use. Again, you can see that this could be a problem if we changed every father to mother, every she to he, and every his to her for the next 10 years. We still have a female anthropomorphic God. And so the fourth layer is using expansive language. Now this is using a language that helps us appreciate all the different ways that we might Im imagine God. It is the kind of thinking about the aspects of creation that help us think about who God is and how God is at work. Things like light and bread and living water, breath, wind, fire, sculpture, and anything else that you can imagine. And I think in the time that we're in, these are some of the spiritual images that a lot of people are connecting to outside of the church and could be a really great area for us to consider. <clears throat> I'm going to feel dumb compared to the last two uh, presentations. <laughs> uh, maybe I can start by asking a few questions of you. Jason said I could talk about communication and social media. So who here has a computer at home? Just raise your hand. Who here has the internet? Who here doesn't have a computer or internet at home? One. Okay. <laughs> Not to single you out, just to... That's a, that's a demographic reality. Canada is one of the most connected countries in the world. Uh, so who here is on Facebook? Almost everybody. Or who here is on any other social media? Not that many of you. Uh, who here knows what a blog is? <laughs> so, who regularly reads blogs or other articles online? Okay, so we're, yeah, we're pretty good. Um, so, I am 32 years old. Is anybody younger than me in this room? Yeah, I'm frequently the youngest person. Oh, my. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Depends on my birthday. So yeah. frequently in church, the youngest person. Frequently, when I'm in an ELCIC context, frequently the youngest person in the room. Um, and I fall into that category called millennial. Who here has heard of the millennials? Most people. So I'll start by going back a little bit. I have information, I'll just say I have information about some of the practical do's and don'ts of social media, if you're interested for your church, as well as some general fact, facts and factoids about uh, millennials, and particularly Christian millennials, which I'll pass out and you can take. So I'm going to tell you more of a story. Um, so as a millennial, I grew up in, as far back as I can remember in school, we had computer classes. Did anybody else have typing or computer classes growing up? If you, no, sorry. <laughs> Typing on a computer class. <laughs> on the little Apple II computer. You did it because they weren't invented until the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I remember in high school, uh, our orientation to the library, in, in high school started in 10, uh, grade 10 where I was, included how to log on to the internet on the library computer. And the librarian held up a compact disc, which almost seems like a little technology, said there's more information stored in here than all of the books on the shelves, right? And so that's a changing world probably that most of you would know, a different world than you probably grown up with or experienced at school that you grew up with. And by the time uh, I was in, and by the time I was in university, I had convinced my parents that we needed a computer with high-speed internet and uh, you know fully online access all the time because I was on the phone using up the phone line to connect to the internet far too often for my parents to liking because they wanted to make phone calls. And so you could probably say that I'm kind of an early adopter in terms of technology. 
Uh, and so pretty quickly, um, I started exploring the online world. And it was sort of a wild west in the beginning with people doing all kinds of things. And there were these bulletin boards, online bulletin boards. Seems like a weird place. It's basically like a place where you could go and have discussions. You write your little, you know, 100 to 1,000 words, however much you wanted, uh, contribute to the discussion, somebody else would, and there would just be this long line of uh, discussion. It's sort of like, if you do read articles online, it's like just the comment sections of online articles. And then this thing, when I started seminary in 2005, there was this thing called Facebook. That, and I started, I joined it, and most people didn't know what it was about, but I joined it, and this online community started to be formed. All the friends I had from high school, uh, from university, were all of a sudden on Facebook too. And instead of leaving them behind in Edmonton when I moved to Saskatoon, they came with me. And they have been with me ever since. They can't get rid of them. <laughs> also at that time, I started a blog. So a blog, for those that don't know, is basically like a weird online diary. At least at that time, in 2005, where people would post, you know, the things that you would normally write in your diary, you put basically in a newspaper article-like thing where the only article was your diary entry, and you put it online for anybody to read, all eight of your friends who might also read your blog. And that's sort of how things were for quite a while. And so in 2009, I graduated from seminary and started into my first parish. I was 26 at the time, and uh, I went to this small rural farming church just outside of Edmonton, Alberta. And for three years, we did great ministry together, but I kept on noticing that we were often talking past one each other when it came to understanding the world. Most of the people in that church remembered a time when there was no electricity on their farms, they talked about how their parents would heat up rocks to put under the blanket on the sleigh that they took to church in the winter. I've never ridden in a sleigh to church, ever. They remembered uh, bringing a horse with them to school and tying it up outside the school so they could ride the horse back home in time for our afternoon chores on the farm. And so there was this vast gulf in experience in terms of what they were uh, experiencing in terms of church and life, and what I had grown up with, learning how to use computers and the internet uh, in school already. And so then I uh, ended up moving, uh, moving on from that parish, and my wife and I ended up here in, in Manitoba. And I started just before summer here at Good Shepherd, and it was the summer of 2013. And uh, I don't know if anybody remembers what a big topic of interest in the summer of 2013 was. But it was millennials. I call it the summer of millennials. But all of a sudden, the world realized that millennials existed. And so there was articles, uh, news, uh, written articles, uh, video articles. And also, Christianity recognized that millennials existed and started asking, why aren't millennials going to church as much as previous generations? And so there's all these articles and information and people asking these questions, what is going on with millennials? And so I was here, it was the slow summer, not a lot of programs, and I had some extra time to read articles, go online, and even though I had started these blogs previously and been blogging for years, wasn't really writing much and nobody was really reading, and so I decided to start again, probably for the fifth or sixth time, a new blog, and I called it The Millennial Pastor, because I was still sorting through these three years of this rural congregation and what the issue was in terms of us not being on the same wavelength when it came to how we understood and experienced church. And the tagline I used for my blog was, an iPhone pastor for a typewriter church. And it's not to suggest that one or the other is better, but it suggests that there's different experiences involved in being church together. And then all of a sudden, I, well, I started writing for a few months, I started in the summer, and then all of a sudden, one day in November, I'd been writing articles every week or so, every few days. I wrote this one article, interestingly enough, about um, men, the difference between uh, male pastors 
from female pastors, and it was a tongue-in-cheek article called 12 Reasons Why Being a Male Pastor is Better. <laughs> and not to suggest that being a male pastor is better, but uh, there's this uh, comedian, uh, Louis C.K., who actually talks about race, about being white. And what he says, he says, uh, white people aren't better, but being white is better because there's all these sort of built-in, you don't have to struggle against the world as much as people of color or different genders do. And so I wrote this tongue-in-cheek list about some of the things that I just have easier because I'm a male than my wife who's a pastor has and challenges that she faces just because of her gender. And before this, my blog maybe had been getting eight people reading a day, two, twelve, and then all of a sudden, 900 people read it in one day. And the next day, 10,000 people read it. And the day after that, 20,000 people read it. And that post has been read 60,000 times. And all of a sudden, um, I had hundreds of Twitter followers, because you could follow me on Twitter from this blog. And I started a Facebook page, and there was, I got 1,000 followers there, and people started reading what I was writing. And I found this whole huge community of young people like me talking about faith, talking about church, talking about what, about what it meant to be a person of faith in this world. Whereas before, I'd never really had that. I didn't go to church with any of my school friends. In fact, most of them didn't go to church at all. So I was basically sort of uh, alone in my Christianity and my growing up because it was not something that we shared so beyond the church context. And so since then, in the past two years, the summer of millennials and starting this blog, I've had 400,000 people come and read my blog in the last few years. And I realized that the world has changed in terms of how we communicate. Most of you have the internet, computer. Who has a smartphone, anybody? Well, so half, half of us have smartphones. Well, if you're a millennial, almost all of us have smartphones. Almost all of us are online and communicating. And this is what our community looks like. Who here thinks that their church is in the phone book? Their church number, like you could find the church number in the phone book. Would you ever consider not putting your church's number in the phone book? Who's got a phone book? Oh yeah, let's say 20 years ago, would you have considered not putting your church's number in your phone book? No. So for a millennial, not having your church on Facebook is like not being, or not being in the phone book was uh, 20 years ago. And so social media is an absolute must for congregations and for us as we go forward, because otherwise people won't know where or how to find us or how to build community with us going forward. Now, how to do that is a whole other question, and that's why I made the hand. All right, thanks. And so I was going to talk a little bit about uh, how things are changing in ministry, specifically within congregations, and, and a couple of the things that um, that I think, based on my experience and from uh, doing reading and research and that sort of thing, that are uh, maybe sticking points that are um, making us trip up on our own feet sometimes, that are maybe worth um, exploring. First one is organization. Um, can I assume that everyone here uh, does not have people competing for spots on church council every year? <laughs> is, that, is that fair? Yes. Okay. Yeah, kind of a struggle. My guess is that you have at least one or two vacancies on church councils, and that's after arm twisting and bribing and all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, the thing is, we have inherited a, uh, a a way of organizing ourselves um, using a committee and council structure uh, that we inherited from the 50s. And you know what? We inherited it from the 50s because everyone used it in the 50s and it worked great in the 50s. How many vital and thriving nonprofits and charitable organizations do you think are around now that still operate that way? My guess is zero. Most places that operate effectively have changed to different models of leadership 
uh, where they focus on direction, where they focus on vision, uh, and no longer boards of people who also have to be chair committees, who have to do all the work and all the planning and all the dreaming and all the everything else. Uh, in the church, we've been stubborn. We've stuck with that, with that uh, model for quite some time. And, um, and I find that it, it's, it saps the energy out of people that would otherwise have more energy to do better work. And I think uh, that there are, are maybe better ways to do that. Uh, the church where I serve at Sherwood Park, we're in the middle of um, talking about um, disbanding our church council and all of our committees. And we will likely do that by February this year. Um, and the way that we're going to do that is to have a smaller group that is in charge of visioning. And we're going to leave all of the actual doing the things and day-to-day -day things to uh, people who have the energy and the expertise to volunteer or that are paid by staff for the church. Uh, we've been trying it out as a, as a model, um, just trying it out to see how it works for, the, for a little while now. We had a, a barbecue with the congregation that rents space in our building in June. Church Council had been working for two and a half meetings uh, on the possibility of that, and at our second meeting had proposed what about maybe this date, can somebody check and get back to us next meeting about whether or not that works? So it would have taken three months to pick a date. I said, let's try this out with our staff and we have our regular staff meetings. They said, sure. The entire event was planned, done, invitation sent out, checked on food allergies, got everyone you know, put together, a date picked, everything done, finished, taken care of, budgeted, everything in 10 days. So that's a model that we're looking at, at running with and going to more event-based kinds of things instead of having you know, a committee that's, that's responsible for dreaming up all kinds of things. Now, a lot of things have to happen to make the sure that that runs well, and I'm not saying it's the end-all, be-all, but it's something that we're going to try uh, as a way of getting past organization. Another problem, I think, within churches is that we are programming ourselves to death. Um, our programs that we have in the church, and by programs I mean uh, separate groups that usually have monthly recurring meetings, right? So, uh, like our ladies' group, or a men's breakfast, or even our Sunday school, or things like that. These are all programs that we accept, we expect to set up once and have them run forever, right? To, to draw people into being um, part of or engaged in, in the church in some way. Now, not to knock these programs, they have been very, very, very helpful. Where would our church be without our ladies groups, right? For the last however many decades. Uh, and that kind of thing. They've been very successful at meeting certain needs. They've been instrumental in people growing in faith. How many of our ladies groups have any ladies under the age of 50 or 60, right? They were excellent at meeting a need in the time that they were set up, but they no longer meet that need. If the purpose, let's say, of a, of, of a women's group is to gather women together to grow in faith, and we're not gathering new women together, then they're not growing in faith, and the group is not fulfilling its purpose, right? So why do we keep pouring our energy and trying to guilt people into showing up at these things and all of that kind of thing for, because we're not ready to say goodbye to a program that was really successful a long time ago? Um, Sunday school is, is another one of those that's kind of a, uh, I don't know, not a pet peeve of mine, I won't go that far, but, uh, most of the research nowadays says that most of these groups segregating people by age or gender or things like that and leaving them on their own is actually more detrimental to our churches because it, it prohibits building community with a diverse group of people. Um, the biggest recent research, the biggest uh, factor as far as whether or not children will remain engaged in a church as youth and young adults and into their adulthood the number one biggest contributor to that is how many relationships they have with people, not their family, of different ages within the congregation, right? So Joe, who passes out the bulletins on Sunday, if he says, hey, little Jimmy, how is school going? That counts. 
the more that that happens, the more likely it is that that young person will remain a part of the church even into adulthood. Um, the biggest factor, bigger factor than whether or not there is a Sunday school or a youth group program. Okay, if it is un, like paramount. Um, and then getting, you know, thinking about purpose, our Sunday school at Sherwood Park Lutheran Church. Um, can I ask, what is the purpose of Sunday school? Anyone? Teach. It's supposed to be the faith formation for children. Right? Faith formation for children, okay. To teach. I know how it started. Yeah, okay, yeah, we know how it started. <laughs> Sunday school started by a, uh, I think in Germany, by a fellow who was taking care of a bunch of street orphans and they weren't learning how to read. So he started a Sunday school using a faith-based curriculum. I think that was 150 years ago. Okay, all right, so teaching kids to read. Okay, but yeah, so nowadays we could say that our Sunday school, the point of it is to, is to teach faith, right? To, to help our younger members to, uh, to grow in faith. Um, people's attendance patterns aren't what they used to be. They, they just aren't, and, and we're not gonna magically change that. Uh, so if you have a family bringing their kid once a month, sort of, not including the summer, they're there, what, six, seven times a year? How effective is it, and how good of a use of our resources is it to maintain a program to have six hours of contact with a child, right? And so at, at Sherwood Park, we were looking at this, and uh, we canceled Sunday school this year, is what we did. Um, not that we don't think that faith formation isn't important. We've actually spent um, far more time thinking about and developing a, a curriculum and resources so that we can resource parents to have conversations with their kids at home, at school, to bring them to worship, to do all of these kinds of things. Uh, we've gone social media uh, resources for them. We have uh, ties with different organizations to try to, to get the idea of teaching faith at home and as a regular part of life to be the, the thing that we're after. And we are hoping, and we'll see, but we're hoping that that will, will make a difference and that that will be more effective than our old Sunday school model of having you know three kids show up on a Sunday. Are you a direct descendant of Luther? No, <laughs> no. That's no. why you wrote the catechism. Yeah, I don't swear as much as he does. <laughs> but he did, he wrote the catechism. Yes. So it, exactly. In, in some way, this is, this is, you know, reliving some of that, right? And uh, it was something on council that had pointed that out, that if you read the introduction to the small catechism, it says that this was written for parents to teach their kids at home, right? So this new idea is 500 years old, right? Um, so anyway, we're doing that, and we're looking at some other cross-generational ministry. The bigger thing uh, that I think is most important for congregations, and I've kind of alluded to it, is figuring out what our purpose is. Why do we exist as a church? Um, and not only just as a church, why do I personally go to church? Why does faith matter? These are incredibly important questions because um, like Eric said, I know that, that millennials especially and, um, and even you know, Gen X to some extent, our communities are more uh, moving online and virtual kinds of things, and we're not going to change that. That's just the way it is, so how do we work with that, right? The thing is that if we don't understand our purpose, if we're not willing to share that, if we can't somehow communicate why faith matters, we are going to continue to um, push people away because people aren't interested in right belief. People are not interested in doctrine anymore. People are interested in an experience of God. They want to know how faith changes their life and other lives. And if we can't tell that story, we are our worst, we are our own worst advertisers. People will not go just because you say it's good for you or that you should go or that there's a building that's there. People are not inspired by the electrical bill has to get paid, all right? My guess is no one here is inspired by the electrical bill has to get paid, right? 
we're inspired by, by faith and what that means. And so um, asking those questions, why do we exist, what's our purpose, will, will I think, guide us to a place where we can be a vital faith community and not just a museum taking care of an old building, right? And I think that that's uh, incredibly important, uh, especially for our new generation. And, uh, and you'll notice nothing that I said had anything to do with worship. Right? I don't think changing the worship is the answer. There are uh, 20 year olds that go to churches that have incense and whatever else going on like crazy. Uh, if it is a place where, where people can find meaning and they know that people understand their purpose, that doesn't matter so much. And on the flip side, if you don't know what you're about and you have the best band and sound system in the entire city, no one's going to care because you're not going to attract people. That way of thinking is, is, I think, kind of dead. The idea of attracting is, isn't it. It's how do we um, communicate what we're about and what matters to us. So I think that's a, a few things as far as congregation, congregations that we might want to uh, think about or try as far as living into our, our faith in the 21st century. So.